Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In Chapter 4 of his work, Utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill is trying to make a case for utilitarianism being able to, to bring in, to, to uh, address the criticisms levied by those who want to say that pleasure and pain, pleasure and lack of pain uh, or happiness cannot be the human being's ultimate end or goal. That there are other things that we find equally valuable and he, he talks about a number of different things, but one of the great rivals that he has to do, that he has to deal with, is this notion of virtue. And this is a term that was used quite a lot in his own time. We don't use it as much these days. But you can substitute in place of virtue, you could say character. Meaning good character, meaning having certain good character traits. Virtues are good traits of character. They're not just things that you do once in a while. They are typical of the virtuous person. So generosity, for example. A person is not generous if they do one generous action. They're generous if they do gener generous actions as an expression of the kind of person that they are. As, as sort of you know, eventually second nature, as their, their go-to, their default. Um, Likewise, a person can be vicious, a person who's greedy, you can count on to act in a greedy way in all across different situations. A person who we say lacks a good work ethic, um, who's lazy, uh, who cuts corners, will cut corners whether they're working on a test, whether they're you know, prepping food, whether they are engaging in counseling, whether they're spending time with their kids or with their you know, aged parents. Um, they, will, they will cut corners. That's part of their, their character. So there were a lot of people who were saying that, that pleasure is not the fundamental good, that virtue, virtuous activity is, uh, or the possession of virtues. Aristotle is a great example of this. So Mill has to try to make a case for how utilitarianism can bring virtue into its own scope. Let's start by thinking about this. Utilitarianism makes happiness the end, the goal. The term he uses is end, but we often talk in terms of goals, right? Our, our desired outcomes. And what is happiness? It's pleasure or a lack of pain overall in one's life. And the way that he, he says people tend to look at this is that other things are just merely means. So whatever goods we have over here, say money, power, opportunity, hard work, uh, a career, um, friends, um, houses, you know, property, cars, all these sorts of things are, are merely goods, education. And what makes them good is that they produce a greater balance of pleasure over which is what we really want, ultimately. We're not really that interested in the goods. We're interested in the pleasure that they provide us or the pain that they, they take away. And Mill says, um, if that was really the case, then we'd have some problems as utilitarians. Uh, he points out when it comes to virtue, he says, um, it's palpable that human beings not only desire happiness, but they desire things which in common language are decidedly distinguished from happiness. They desire, for example, virtue and the absence of vice. Well, let's think about this for a minute. And we'll go back to the text. Um, there is within at least many of 
us, a desire to at least be able to think of ourselves as having good character traits or as not having bad character traits. Going beyond that in, in some of us, there is a genuine desire to actually have good character traits, not just to think of ourselves that way or to appear to others that way, but to actually be just, courageous, generous, to be that kind of person, to be a good person in, in the full sense, to be a noble person, to be a stand-up guy, to, you know, and we can talk about this in all different ways. And there is some cultural variance in exactly how these are think, thought about, and even within cultures, there's arguments about exactly which character traits are more important and what they should look like. We're going to put that aside for the moment. Likewise, when somebody finds out that they have bad character traits, they, they often don't want to think of themselves as having those. Um, you know, procrastination, for example, which is often an expression of perfectionism, um, is something that a person will tell themselves is not really that big of a deal, or um, is something they only do once in a while, when really it's become rooted in, in who they are, and it would take a lot of work to, to get rid of it. And you know, why do we lie to ourselves about these things? In part because we, we don't want to think of ourselves as vicious. You know, if I have a, a, a bad temper problem, I don't want to think of myself as having a, a genuinely vicious disposition with respect to anger. Um, I want to think of myself as just once in a while going off the handle or going a little too far. So Mill is right. People do, in fact, desire virtue in the absence of vice. And they, they desire this no less really, he says, than they desire pleasure in the absence of pain. The desire of virtue is not as universal, but it, but it is as authentic, he says, a fact, as the desire of happiness. So it looks then like we have to say there are other rival ends, rival goals, and one of these would be virtue. Is this really the case? So he says, does the utilitarian doctrine deny that people desire virtue or maintain that virtue is not a thing to be desired? The very reverse. It maintains not only that virtue is to be desired, but it is to be desired disinterestedly. So what that rules out is making, I'm going to erase some of this stuff here, making virtue into a mere means for, for happiness. Now, how would that take place? Um, well, you know, if you act in, in certain ways so as to win social approval, to av avoid incurring punishment, then uh, your virtuous disposition would merely be a means to the end of having pleasure and not having pain. And you might even say to yourself, you know, I don't really feel like being a generous person or being honest or being courageous, but it would be better for me overall. If, you know, if I think about this rationally, prudentially, if I look at the long term, uh, I, I'd probably have a better life, which would include more pleasure and less pain, if I were to cultivate in myself these virtues and if I were to erase from my uh, character, soul, personality, however you want to put it, vices. That would be an instrumental way of looking at virtue. Virtue is not a good in itself, then. Virtue is merely a means to the end of happiness. To disinterestedly endorse virtue is to say that virtue is, in fact, a good that is an end. Something that is desired for its own sake and desirable for its own sake. So he says, utilitarians can get behind this. How? He says, well, utilitarians place virtue at the very head of things which are good as means to the ultimate end, like this. But they also recognize, as a psychological fact, the possibility of it being to the individual a good in itself without looking to any end beyond it, and hold that the mind is not in a right state, not in a state conformable to utility, not in the state most conducive to the general happiness, unless it really does love virtue in this manner. So what this means is that happiness actually becomes 
bigger than we thought. Virtue is not only a means to happiness, virtue is also a component of happiness. And not just virtue for outward appearance, not just virtue as like something you could take a pill and do, but virtue understood by the individual as something that is good for them, good in itself, something they can entirely endorse and say, this needs to be part of who I am. So Mill says, this works for a lot of other things. He says, the ingredients of happiness are very various, and each of them is desirable in itself, not merely when considered as swelling and aggregate. The principle of utility does not mean that any given pleasure as music, for instance, or any given exemption from pain as, for example, health, is to be looked at as merely a means to a collective something termed happiness and desired on that account. They are desired and desirable in and for themselves. Besides being means, they are part of the so the same thing holds for virtue. Now, this raises some questions. How do we get there? How do we arrive at such a state where we would come to identify virtue not only as a means, you know, something prudential, but as, as a part, a component of the genuinely happy life? Um, this is something that would appear to be a bit puzzling. So what Mill says is, let's think about other goods. Think about money, for example. Why do you want money? Because pretty much all of us do. What is it about money that actually makes it desirable for you? So he says, it's association. Association with, with the thing uh, that it is a means to. So, you have some money, you're able to buy some things that you like, what does that give you? That gives you pleasure. Or you can use the money to take to you know, take care of situations that are causing you pain, you take away that pain, you now have an association of good feelings or you know, the removal of bad feelings with money. And the more that you do it, the more of these feelings uh, you have and the more consolidated, the more intense they become, they have sort of fused together and it becomes part of the affective, let's call it the affective uh, halo or signature of that good. Um, he says the same thing could be said about the majority of the great objects of human life, power, for example, or fame. Um, except that to each of these, there's a certain amount of immediate pleasure in the next. We like the feeling of power. We like the feeling of, of people being more, more swell guys or girls. Um, but why do we come to value these as part of, of happiness? We do that because of the good associations, the, with, originally with pleasure and removal of pain that come about, and eventually, even if these things aren't causing us pain or pleasure directly, we still have that good association. We come to see them as ends on their own. So he says, um, in these sorts of cases, the means have become a part of the end and a more important part of it than any of the things that they're means to. So power can become the end for some people. Fame can become the end for some people. Really, you could go, you could look at the traditional list of all the possible goods that are candidates for happiness, and you can come up with some sort of psychological explanation, according to Mill, about how an individual would come to value that good so, so highly. Security, for example, uh, one's job, a relationship, um, stamp collecting, you know, pick whatever you like. Now, what about virtue? So, he says, um, virtue, according to the utilitarian conception, fits this kind of uh, description. Originally, we didn't desire it. We didn't desire these character traits. Why did we come to desire them? We associated them with pleasure. Probably because doing these sorts of things brought about good situations for us in which things worked out well. Think about courage, for example. Not only is that something that tends to be admired by other people, but also it helps you get things done. It helps you get things accomplished. So you come to associate it with the, the good feelings that come about you know, from, from whatever it is that, that got accomplished. And generosity, you know, 
other people will praise it and like you and, and talk you know, about you as a good person. And you like that, and so then you come to associate generosity itself with the pleasure that you get from it. And then after a while, you lose sight of this association. You begin to, um, like he says, through the though the association may be formed, it may be felt a good in itself and desired with as great intensity as any other good. And um, virtue eventually, he says, those who desire virtue for its own sake desire it either because the consciousness of it is a pleasure or because the consciousness of being without it is a pain. It gets so closely tied in with our pleasures and pains that if we go far enough with it, we actually feel a sense of pain in lacking a virtue or discovering vice within ourselves or in other people, like say a friend. And over time, we forget about all this association that's taking place, much of it, you know, subconsciously um, or unconsciously, you know, the thing. And we come to see virtue then as something that is an integral component of happiness. And it becomes very difficult for us to conceive of the happy life without virtue or the vicious life as being a happy life. That's how Mill tries to incorporate what he thinks is right about virtue ethics into utilitarianism. It's an interesting argument, trying to show that utilitarianism can actually cover all, all these other things. And it could be used to talk about other goods, but he's focusing primarily on the good uh, of, of virtue. 